Well, it's very puzzling to understand just what is going on with global warming. Every day there seems to be some new apocalyptic story in the news, as well as a counterclaim saying, what are you talking about, global warming? Your scientist's ship is stuck in polar ice for weeks and they have to be rescued. I mean, here are just a sampling of some of the headlines from Drudge today. The heat is on. NOAA and NASA say 2014 is the warmest year on record. Third time in a decade, the globe has sizzled to its highest yet. New York Times is also agreeing that it's the hottest year on record, surpassing even 2010. The Washington Post says, scientists say human activity has pushed Earth beyond four of nine planetary boundaries. And at the rate things are going, the Earth in the coming decades could cease to be a safe operating space for human beings. So of course, that's the push to get the elites off the planet, right? They're going to destroy this one and maybe set up shops somewhere else. Well, my guest today is one of those dissenting voices. His article is there up at the top of Drudge Report. Uh, Scientists balk at hottest year claims, ignoring satellites showing 18 year pause. Mark Morano is best known as the founder of ClimateDepot.com, uh, which really works to promote a positive voice on environment and development issues and really push back against all of this apocalyptic rhetoric that basically just extorts the public under the guise of environmental protection. Mark, thank you for joining us today. So we've got the global warming establishment really continuing with this chaos campaign. Not only is the sky falling, I mean, the climate is pretty much ruined and there's no turning back. Uh, but what you point out in your article is that we're dealing with dueling sets of data. How so? Yeah, right now, today, they're declaring it's the hottest year. Last year was the hottest year on record. Of course, records go back to uh, the late 19th century. So first of all, that's kind of laughable that we're only talking 120 years. Second of all, they're comparing coverage of temperatures way back in the 19th century, which was nowhere near as good, even the early part of the 20th century. So you're really comparing apples and oranges and the way things have been measured and the way things have changed. Beyond that, they are basically ignoring satellite data, which was actually set up by NASA to say to, to be more accurate, which shows that we're 18 years plus in global warming pause or standstill or no temperature change, which means every kid in high school today has never had a day of global warming in their life. So what they've done is they've got adjusted surface data, and they're trying to claim it's the hottest year on record. Well, the problem is they're... It, the, the pause, global warming pause continues, so the, the way they make it sound like it's the hottest, they're talking about hundreds of a degree Fahrenheit, which you can't even measure by thermometers. It's a statistical anomaly. It's meaningless, and they actually admit this in previous NASA press releases, but they're not announcing that today. And they're claiming that these statistically meaningless differences mean it's a record hot year, when in reality it's a fancy way of saying the global warming pause continues. This is nothing but orchestrated politics. They're using climate data. They adjust it, monkey around with it, and they come up with statistically meaningless uh, data. And then they claim politically meaningful concepts, which is we better do something. Congress needs to act. We need to sign U.N. treaties. This is all orchestrated. The Obama administration issues a similar type reports, uh, making all sorts of scary global warming predictions. And these are federal government scientists. They know where the bread is buttered. So they go along with the politics of it. At the same time, they're allowing the data to be bastardized uh, and prostituted, if you will, in the service of politics. And that's exactly what anyone who claims hottest year uh, last year means. And, and by the way, scientists are laughing at this. One scientist actually said, I hope you laugh out loud if someone tells you it was the hottest year on record. <laughs> uh, it's, just, it's just total nonsense from beginning to end, but it's powerful nonsense. And it's meaningful nonsense because this is what they're going to do to ram a new U.N. climate treaty down our throats. This is what they're using to ram EPA uh, regulations down our throats. This is what they're using to, quote, fundamentally transform our economy, unquote, as the United Nations stated goal is to do is fundamentally transform the way of life of everyone on the planet in order to fight global warming. Right. And, and you point out this this pause that they're really refusing to bring into their data. But when uh, people do speak about it, they say, oh, well, our government policies are responsible for the pause. So basically, we should push even harder. This was an article out of the Daily Mail. They said warming yeah, may have is, decreased, but just shows how good these green policies are working. 
Yes, excellent point, Liam. This is this is true medieval witchcraft. In order, in other words, if you cast a spell on someone as a witch, and something bad <laughs> happens to them, you can go around and say, "I cast that spell, and look what happened. They got in a car accident." They are literally claiming, a U.K. energy minister, as you just mentioned, the U.K. Daily Mail, that the pause in global warming, 18-plus years, 18 years, three months to be exact, and counting, was due to all these green energy policies and somehow the solar and wind subsidies and all this central planning of our energy economy and shutting down coal plants and carbon offsets and carbon taxes and all the stuff that everyone's been doing has resulted in the global warming slowing down. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> the problem is CO2 levels have continued to rise despite all of this silly central planning uh, alleged energy solutions to global warming. So there's no way that could be correct, but they're actually starting to take credit for the pause. And this is, again, true medieval witchcraft. It's true astrology. It's like your horoscope that would say a bunch of vague things you know, you will make much money in your life or something, and then you win the lottery one day. Hey, my horoscope predicted it. They were right. It's, it's, it's the most basis of – anyone with a base note level of logic can see through it, but they're actually presenting this as science now, and that's where it gets incredibly scary because this is moronic science from beginning to end when they start claiming stuff like that. Right, and we've seen so many instances throughout history where they say the science is settled, the earth is flat, yeah. we don't need your dissenting <laughs> opinion, and the science isn't settled on this, yet it is it is almost like witchcraft because they're really pushing out this propaganda and, and tricking everyone so that they can say it's the warmest year on record, period, don't even question it, these are the facts, and here yeah. are the policies that we need to put in place to magically make it disappear. And they do it through these allegedly prestigious institutions like NASA. And everyone has generally a good opinion of NASA. Well, let's take a look at NASA and global warming. The man who just stepped down about two years ago was Dr. James Hansen. And he was the lead global warming scientist in the U.S. He's been arrested at least six times protesting energy development based on the fact that he, he believes we can't have any more coal plants or oil pipelines because globe, the Earth can't handle it and we're all going to die. James Hansen, NASA's lead global warming scientist, endorsed a book calling for ridding the world of industrial civilization, for raising cities, blowing up dams, and turning off our greenhouse gas machine. James Hansen, NASA's lead global warming scientist, now retired just a year or two ago, uh, said that the author of that book had it exactly right. The book sounded like it was written by the Unabomber, but NASA's lead global warming scientist gave the book praise, and it's actually on Amazon.com. Uh, it's a book by Keith Barnish. It's actually on Amazon.com. It's a, it's a jacket sleeve of the book. NASA's lead global warming scientist endorsing this book. He said that he's also, uh, just to show you his agenda, Leanne, the NASA Global Warming Institution, the lead scientist, Hansen, had said that global warming uh, coal was equivalent to the trains that took Jews to, to Nazi Germany. They made all sorts of Nazi analogies. He said that skeptics were guilty of crimes against humanity. Uh, implying we should be subject to some kind of Nuremberg trial. This was the man in charge of our global temperature data set. And wow. we're supposed to think, oh, well, global warming, it's all about science and these evil deniers. The man in charge of it was endorsing stuff that sounded like it was written by the Unabomber. That's the agenda we're dealing with. This is all agenda. The EU Climate Commissioner has said even if we're wrong on the science, we're doing right by policy on global warming. Well, what does that mean? That means it doesn't matter whether global warming is happening or not. All that matters is we go for their policies. And what are their policies? Centrally planned global carbon taxation moving toward, in their words, global governance. And that's the key word. Al Gore has used it. F former French President Jacques Chirac has used that phrase. U.N. officials have used that phrase. And they've openly talked about how U.N. climate policies are essentially going to redistribute wealth. They're going to redistribute wealth by climate policy. All, it's unbelievable. And it doesn't stop with the United Nations. I just came back from West Virginia, the capital, in Charleston, t testifying against these common core uh, science standards, and we lost. The, the, the West Virginia School Board tried to just allow the fact that there's natural variability, that scientists dissent, that climate models have failed, and the common core education establishment came out in force and intimidated and bullied the West Virginia Board of Education, so they had to overturn the slight skeptical changes, which were 100 percent accurate scientifically, because the, the Common Core Science curriculum teaches kids from kindergarten through high school there is no debate and no dissent allowed on global warming. Well, I see here also on, on uh, ClimateDepot.com, there's a quote that points out that some of these Common Core educational standards are funded um, 
Exxon Mobil and Chevron. They've funded yeah, some at, of these. <laughs> there's the irony of this. At this hearing, right. they were saying all skeptics were funded by Exxon Mobil and the evil fossil fuel companies, which isn't true. That in fact. The fossil fuel company, uh, the natural gas industry, gave more to the Sierra Club uh, a few years back than the combined budgets of, like, the top three or five global warming skeptic organizations that ever received in the history of the organizations from fossil fuel. So it's just silly nonsense when they say that. But that's interesting because it's big corporate America that's funding these changes to our education. And, 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 and that actually, you know, a lot of these oil companies and big energy companies, they support carbon taxes and other stuff, the global warming skeptics, which tend to be conservative, libertarian, Cato Institute and others, would never support. So the idea that, uh, you know, the evil industry money is tainting skeptics makes no sense when, you know, you could argue that the, the fossil fuel companies are giving more to environmentalists in order to look green than they've ever given to anyone uh, opposed to the environmental agenda. Right. It's definitely like funding both sides of the war there. Well, we see, obviously, we know that there's been, uh, you know, Obama's targeting the oil and gas industry. He just has demanded massive reduction in methane emissions. What's the end game here and what can people do? The end game is very simple. John Holdren is, is Obama's science czar. In the 1970s, he wrote an article saying one of the hazards of, of a free society was too much energy too soon. And he, in this article, he lamented that people get in their car and drive down to the grocery store and get a six-pack of beer and drive home, as though this was the greatest transgression that could ever happen to the face of the earth. They want to radically transform our lives. And what they're going to start with is centrally planning our economies and our energy. And if you can get a chokehold on energy, which is what they're doing, they're closing existing power plants, and they're going to be heavily regulating new ones. They're not allowing expanded oil drilling in places like the Arctic and other places. And they want, now now the gas prices are low because OPEC is flooding the market in order to try to um, hurt fracking industry, which has devastated you know, the, the, the OPEC countries, hurting the OPEC countries. Uh, they want to do a huge gas tax. And are you ready for this, Leanne? Republicans in, the, in Washington are sounding very favorable to a gas tax. They're calling it a user fee. So finally, American consumers get a nice break when it comes to energy, and the government's going to move right in and start tacking on taxes. And then, of course, OPEC is going to stop flooding the market, and gas is going to go back up. But this time, you don't expect any repeal of gas taxes, do you? It is a collusion at this point between Obama and the Republican leadership and many of the Republicans. It's so, it's so appalling what's happening. And we're going forward with this. Their end game is to essentially plan our energy economy. If they can control – one scientist said it best, Richard Linden, he who controls carbon dioxide controls life. It's a bureaucrat's dream to control carbon dioxide. That was according to Richard Linden of MIT. That is the key because they're going to be able to control everything from transportation to agriculture to waterways to airlines to our, our cars, to our home heating, to every aspect of our life is going to be heavy, reg, heavily regulated because of the urgent and immediate danger of global warming that they claim. Right. And then when people do try to uh, get off the grid or be self-sustainable, uh, then they start figuring out how to tax those people and applying user fees. Oh, well, you're driving in your electric car and you know it's not getting enough income. So now we're going to tax you for the miles that you drive. And I mean, is there anything that we can do? It seems like everything we try to do to be good, <laughs> good little citizens, I mean, it seems futile. Yeah, well, they're, not, they're interested in, in controlling every aspect is the simplest way. But that's when Nancy Pelosi went to China and said, we need a complete inventory in every aspect of our lives to battle global warming. Now, the Japanese government, as literally their environmental minister is on record telling its citizens to go to bed an hour early. The Germans, <laughs> to fight global warming, to lose less energy. The Germans climate advisor or the environmental minister, they did a, a whole um, public service announcement. And that in these announcements, they basically said you should have make love in the dark in order to save electricity. <laughs> UK is proposing carbon ration cards that your employers would issue each employee, and it would monitor your airline travel, your, your car mileage, your home energy use. And if you go above a certain amount, you owe money. If you go below, you get a kind of credit. Levels of control they're going to be monitoring every aspect of our life. The, the German climate advisor said we need a CO2 budget for every man, woman, and child on the planet, administered by some international body, most likely the United Nations. This is the reason Vaclav Klaus, the former Czech Republic president who grew up under communism, said, with the fall of the Eastern Bloc communists and the Soviet Union, the greatest threat 
that the world faces to their freedom today is what he calls ambitious environmentalism, and particularly the climate change agenda and how they want to transform our lives. That's what Christina Sikirins, the U.N. climate chief, actually is on record as saying people need a complete transformation. And they laud China. The U.N. head <laughs> laud China as it, for its ability to get things done and not have any interference from, from the messiness of democracy. And they like the way that China can move forward and make policies happen. Right. Yeah. They, they have been lauding China a lot in the past, especially with the way that they uh, repress all of their the freedom of the press there and get their corral their citizens to do their bidding. Uh, meanwhile, they're one of the most polluted nations that exists. Um, well, so what does this mean? Should we all just go and get a horse and move to the middle of nowhere and hope that we can just gouge our eyes out and give up? No, yeah. No. No. Actually, <laughs> what it really means is. This has to be opposed. I mean, unfortunately, our enemies are now not only President Obama and the United Nations, but it's, it's going to include Speaker Boehner and uh, Mitch McConnell, because that, that, we have to fight the Republican leadership on this stuff. Historically, Republic, and, and the big problem we actually face is going to be the Republican presidential nominee. Here's, here's the bottom line. Global warming skeptics have won every battle of this uh, debate. Mm -hmm. We've won the science battle. So much so that Nobel Prize winners like Ivar Diavar, who endorsed President Obama for president, he won the Nobel Prize for physics, has reversed his view and is now skeptical of man-made global warming. And he says he's ashamed of his country, Norway, for giving a Nobel Prize to Al Gore in the United Nations. We've won the science debate. We've won all the policy battles. We've prevented cap and trade. We've prevented carbon taxes. We've prevented the ratification of the past UN treaty, the Kyoto Protocol. The problem is we would never prepared, and I mean we being uh, global warming skeptics, for someone like Obama, who I believe will be the most transformational president since FDR. No one will come close. He's surpassed uh, Lyndon B. Johnson in terms of transforming America. When it comes to everything from health, uh, health care, immigration, climate policy now, even foreign policy, what he's done to executive orders that Republicans will never have the guts, the fortitude, the balls, if you will, to ever overturn these. If they do overturn, they'll overturn some, but this is going to be a major advance. He's going to sign a U.N. treaty, and he's going to have it ratified or go into ratification under existing treaties so he doesn't have to submit it. He's doing deals with China without congressional consent, you know, climate deals. Mm -hmm. And the only way to stop him, you would need a strong Republican nominee or at least an opposition party nominee, and I doubt a third party is going to win, in 2016 to stand up and say, I'm going to revoke all of these executive orders. I'm going to withdraw from the United Nations process. But here's the question. Chris Christie, likely Republican nominee, he, his own EPA in New Jersey, praised Obama's EPA policies. Uh, so I doubt it's going to be Chris Christie because he's reversed this stuff. He used to be a skeptic, and for political expediency, he uh, became a global warming believer and talks about the consensus and everything else. Jeb Bush, I don't trust for a second on this. Uh, and the other one is Mitt Romney, who actually had John Holdren advising him and had Dina McCarthy and others that are in Obama's administration when it came to environmental policy. So the three mainstream Trump runners of the Republicans uh, are going to be very suspect, if not opposed, uh, to skeptics on this global warming agenda. So mm. we face a huge problem because if the, if the next president is a Democrat or a weak Republican, which is likely to be one of those two, right. the EPA policies will be permanent. The U.N. Uh, commitments we make will probably go forward to decades, and we are going to be the global warming establishment will have won the global warming war. That's just the way it's going to go. They're going to have massive regulations on coal plants, on oil, on fracking, and they're going to have massive international entanglements. And the next president, being weak Republican or, or Democrat, will continue them. And that's the likely scenario, unless, you know, somehow we break that logjam. Yeah, if we can just wake the people up to, to see the reality of this huge push for this agenda, uh, this UN agenda. Uh, well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll stay tuned, climatedepot.com. Be sure to call us back, get back with us if you've got any updates on what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Okay. Well, there it is. Looks like we could be dealing with checkmate unless we do our part to push back against all of this indoctrination and propaganda. And